I'm Edward October, and this is A Nefarious Nightmare. This podcast contains foul language and discussions of violence. Additional trigger warnings will be posted as needed in the show notes. Listener discretion is advised. On Good Friday, 1988, not long after her eighth birthday, a sweet, precocious little girl went missing. Her family recalls that this just wasn't like her. To leave and stay gone without calling or talking to her family first? Meanwhile, a monster was callously and quietly existing in a neighborhood that was trusting and safe, terrorizing the family with notes handwritten in crayon. This case was known by many as, quote, the girl who was almost forgotten, as it took 30 years from this cold case to be solved. With that, I'm Courtney Fenner. And I'm Amanda Cronin. And a nefarious nightmare presents Monster Hidden in Sight, the murder of April Tinsley. creating this episode due to the fact that it was done when we were brand new, and we want to give you all this story in a much better way. Courtney had lost it several times during the original episode, and she and I decided it would be best to table the original. We later decided to just retell the story. With that, we want to shout out Brenda Mitchell, one of our most frequent listeners, for suggesting this case to us. We had requested case suggestions on Facebook, and she sent this one. Evidently, until very recently, many people had almost no idea about April's case, including us. The horrendous acts that have occurred in this case is something I can't even begin to process. When I first opened the link that she sent, I felt a shot in my gut. This little girl looks strikingly similar to my own little girl. I almost refused to do this story because the minute I started reading about it, my eyes welled up with tears. But something inside of me kept saying, Courtney, you have to. So we need to remember April. She was almost forgotten and we need to remember her. In this episode, I want to dedicate my love and deepest sympathies to the Tinsley family. On the very, very off chance that they are listening, please know that I have fully immersed myself in the shoes of Janet Tinsley to tell this story because as a mother of a little girl myself, one who bears a shocking and even heartbreaking resemblance to April, I have to tell this story in a way I would want it told had I been April's mother or even April herself. April Marie Tinsley was born March 18, 1980 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. She was a second grader at Fairfield Elementary School and a member of the choir at Faith United Methodist Church. We did try to reach out to Janet Tinsley, her mother, to get a good idea of what April was like, but since this case is solved, the family has stepped down from any interviews. They do have a Facebook page dedicated to her memory. We will link it in the show notes along with the rest of our sources. With that, what we do know is April is described as bright, friendly, and someone who could stand her ground. Family members have described her as carefree, precocious, funny, and also a bit shy. And looking at her pictures, you really do pick that up. She was truly happy, well-loved. She seemed precocious. In another podcast that covered this case, the family did describe April as a fighter and would basically refuse to get in the car with strangers. Her parents are Mike and Janet, and April also did have a little brother. Fort Wayne was known as a city with a safe suburban neighborhoods. It was known in 1988 as a great place to raise your children. It was kind of known as one of those cities where everybody knew each other and all the children played together. People would leave their doors unlocked, things like that. On April 1st, 1988, which was Good Friday, weather was forecast to be rainy all Easter weekend. April had just turned eight years old. It was after school and April asked her mom, Janet, if she could go outside to play with her friends. Janet said that this was fine and to take an umbrella, so April made it to her friend's house and called her mom, told her that she'd made it and everything was okay. So April was out playing with her friends, one by the name of Nicole. 
It started to sprinkle and they all started to walk home. The friends and April had separated because April left her umbrella at Nicole's house. April never made it home. And by all accounts, Janet said that this was not like April. She always came home when she was supposed to. Janet went to Nicole's house expecting April to be there, but nobody had seen her. It got to be about 3 or 4 p.m. that very day, and Janet went ahead and started tracking. She called everyone she had known April was around. Nobody had seen her. She called Nicole's mom, or maybe went to her house, and her mom hadn't seen April since she showed up initially to call her mom. Then, Janet filed a missing persons report. The full description of April that day, she was last seen wearing a pair of light blue pants with white hearts all over them, purple sneakers, and a pink and red jacket. This is one of the few times back then that police took a missing persons report seriously, and they started looking for her right away. It was something like 75 volunteers that searched the entire neighborhood for her, and after an exhaustive search, they found nothing. At one point, a witness came to investigators and claimed to have seen a child being dragged into a dark blue truck. The witness said the man had light brown hair, facial stubble, and appeared to have been in his mid-30s. This synced up well timing-wise, and a composite sketch of this man had been created. The composite was pretty basic, your typical mid-30s white male, but it neared a major similarity to Janet's brother, who had back surgery the day before. So that lead was quickly disregarded after confirmation that he was in the hospital recovering from surgery. So with that, as well as a public appeal that followed, no leads were produced. Quoted from one of our sources, WPTA21.com, There was a lot of times where I had people say to me, you should have kept her home. You should have kept her home. You can't prison your own child. You gotta let them outside and play. Her mother had said that to WPTA21. I want everyone listening to pay attention to what I'm about to say. In short, Janet did not do anything wrong. Any anger that you have with this case directed at the shitbag that did what he did to her. Janet, from everything I've heard and read, is a mother who is really on top of her A-game and provided both a fun and nurturing environment to her children, as well as a whole lot of wisdom. April was raised in the regard where she would not be the type to get in a car with a stranger. Her mother, who had been quoted as saying, April is a fighter. She wouldn't just get into the car with someone she didn't know without a fight. End quote. Jana did a fantastic job to make sure that April was aware of the dangers that lurked. And in the 80s, we all knew our neighbors in our neighborhood, particularly in a city like Fort Wayne, Indiana. In all this, Janet was well ahead of the time. She trusted her kids to know what bad things were out there, but also had the grace to trust those closest to them. Yeah, so I just want to clarify this now and well ahead of time that again, Janet, her family, the neighbors, they did nothing wrong. They absolutely have no blame in any of this. They gave any and all the information that they could, and so far, the police did a great job being on top of this too. It was the 80s, and back then, it was a different time. It was normal to be outside to play. We're now in 2022. We have all of these advances in forensics, technology, etc. Which is, let's be real here, it's both a good and a bad thing. We know a lot more about what surrounds us, who surrounds us. We know a lot more about what's happening, thanks to having that information right at our fingertips, but in 2022, it's difficult to feel trusting enough to let your kid go play, and unfortunately, criminals have evolved with the technology. In short, everything has evolved, and it's just become a double-edged sword. People know how to hide in plain sight. It's best to keep an objective point of view here, because times are different. The bad news about back then is... Things weren't as advanced, so bad people could easily hide, whereas now, they can't so easily, but my fear is that they've changed along with evolution. Three days after the initial report was filed and after searching, on April 4th, 1988, a jogger by the name of John Klein passed by a ditch near a road in DeKalb County, which was approximately 36 minutes away from April's home, about 30 miles and noticed a lifeless little girl. The body was quickly identified, 
sadly, is April Tinsley. She had all of the same clothes on that she had when she went missing, except that one shoe was missing. They found the other shoe later on on the other side of the road, approximately 700 feet away. Upon the autopsy, they noticed that April's clothes were still on as normal, except that the underwear she had on was inside out. They suspected a sexual assault had occurred. They found semen on the underwear, confirming the suspicion. But at this time, it wasn't enough for hard evidence. However, they preserved any forensic evidence as they knew it very well could be viable in the future. They also did find a sex toy not far from where April was found. The town that was once known as safe, where kids could play, be free, now kids couldn't go anywhere alone or without a parent. The autopsy had concluded that the cause of death was asphyxiation, she was suffocated, and that this little girl indeed had been raped. It had been reported that April was suffocated two days prior, and that her body was dumped into a ditch earlier that day, in broad daylight, for everybody to see, which is fucked up. This is where the police had a theory that the offender lived in the area and knew the area well due to how bold he was in this matter. At this point, police questioned all sex offenders in the area, asked where they had been and what their alibi was, and if they had had a blue truck. At one point, a large amount of tips came in from several people saying that the sketch looked an awful lot like a 34-year-old man known by the name of Everett Scholl, a.k.a. Moose. He did own a blue truck. He was known to have been bugging children at playgrounds and parks and saying inappropriate things to them. He had been questioned three months prior to all of this on a child molestation claim. He was never charged for that, but it was mentioned by one of the detectives that just because an individual doesn't have a criminal record doesn't mean that they can't commit a crime like this. Moose had also lived just a block or so away from where April lived. He had his own children and claimed to have went to church pretty regularly according to Investigation Discovery, which the show was called Predator at Large, I Will Kill Again. And this was in the midst of the satanic panic, so people came forward and said that he was in a gang that practiced Satanism, and it was also said that he did have access to a blue truck, but didn't own one. Detectives then went to find him, but he had left four hours prior and his family didn't know where he was. April's body was released for the funeral. Press and police attended the funeral looking for Moose. He never showed up. At this point, he was looking suspicious. About seven days after April goes missing, they get reports that he is creeping around playgrounds and police go and get him for questioning. His alibi was that he was out drinking with friends at the time of her disappearance. And everyone that police had talked to vaguely confirmed that he was at other places. The alibis only vaguely lined up. The police keep questioning Moose and he even agrees to a polygraph test, which came out in Moose's favor. So this tip was tabled because they had no evidence on Moose. The entire neighborhood was on high alert, putting up posters, just keeping a lookout, trying to keep April's memory alive. But that well had started to run dry because nothing and nobody was coming forward. Nothing. Nothing. Late May in 1990, a barn 14 miles away from where April went missing, uh, it was described as isolated and dimly lit. Someone wrote on this barn in crayon, I kill 8-year-old April Marie Tinsley. I will kill again. It was written in a childlike manner with several things misspelled. And we'll post the pictures in our show notes, of course. It was questioned if this was a troll or the actual killer when two days later, words are added to this message. Quote, Did you find her other shoe? Ha ha. They decided that this was indeed the killer because... The information about the missing shoe was kept really close to the chest, which meant nobody else knew about the missing shoe except for the detectives and, of course, the killer. So now the killer is parading his action and playing cat and mouse, basically, just trolling the fuck out of these detectives, as well as the neighborhood, who is gripped with fear at this point. And three weeks later, the fear escalates because seven-year-old Sarah Jean Boker goes missing. She was last seen in the area that April was abducted. Search dogs found Sarah's stuffed animal approximately 16 hours later, and not too far away, they found Sarah's dead body in a creek. The autopsy revealed bruising to her neck and fluids in her underwear. 
This is the same M.O. as April. This is to the point where everyone's really picking up the fear. Everyone's on the lookout in the hunt for a child rapist and killer picks up speed. There were no leads or witnesses in Sarah's case, and at this point, April's case started to get, you know, put to the back burner, and the city stays in a state of fear and high alert. And over the years, you know, the case is still active. Police tells April's family that they're still working on it, but there's still no leads. No tips came in. Eventually, April's case goes cold. There's zero breakthrough, no sign of the killer. Everything goes quiet, but the community is still left wondering. Her parents are persistently asking police if there's anything, but there's nothing. In May of 2004, Memorial Day, in a nearby suburb, seven-year-old Emily Higgs was outside playing. Note that Emily pretty much resembles both Sarah and April, so this follows the offender's M.O. I did learn a lot about preferential offenders at the job I've mentioned that I used to work for. Um, This job assisted in child serving organizations and preventing sex offenders and pedophiles and the like from working or volunteering in a place that serves children. So the definition of a preferential offender in any case is where the offender's MO is to choose someone based off of their quote unquote type. Most serial killers have what's known as a victim type. Ted Bundy, for example, seemed to prefer petite brunette women because they resembled someone who he was fond of but broke his ego. I could be very wrong about that as I haven't particularly dove deep into Ted Bundy, but that's pretty much what we have gathered. But the point is, a preferential offender has a type. In the case of a pedophile, for example, a preferential offender may have a type such as, I don't know, 14-year-old boys and In this case, blonde girls that were around seven or eight years old. So she finds a note scrawled on yellow notebook paper in a baggie on her bike that says, and I'm going to quote this word for word with the misspellings and all, so that way you guys can hear it. But quote, hi, honey, I've been watching you. I am the same person that kidnapped and raped and killed April Tinzeli. You are my next victim. If you don't report this to police, and I don't see this in the paper tomorrow or on the local news, or I will blow you, your house, killing everyone, but you will be mine. I am the same person that can apt and rape and murder April Tinsley. You, our next, haha. End quote. Also, what was found with the note was a used condom. I want to mention here that this is 2004, and DNA evidence is really starting to take off. This was obviously traumatizing to that family, but the silver lining is that it is significant evidence. Almost a week later, two more young girls that match the preferential offender's MO are targeted. As they find notes wrapped in baggies, there weren't used condoms this time. There are disturbing Polaroid photos, though, of a man from the waist down masturbating. A strange comforter or quilt was seen. Thankfully, the photo is not available, but the comforter in the background, which is a weird green and blue paisley print, was sought out. Emily's mother is noted as saying, quote, it's almost as if he wanted to be caught, referring to all the evidence that he left around. And he was leaving it around willy-nilly. And it, I agree, it was as if he wanted to get caught. I'm pretty sure, in my own opinion, that he wanted that recognition that most serial killers end up wanting. So police are beginning to wonder if this is actually the same person and where the hell has he been for the past 14 or 15 years? Then another girl receives a note. Here is this note, again, word for word, misspellings and all. Quote, Hi, honey. I've been watching. Here is some my cum for you. I am the same person that kidnapped, rape, and killed April Tinsley, and you are next if I see you out alone. And if I don't see anything about this in newspaper or TV news, I will blow up your howl. I have planted bombs some in your house. Police really want to make sure this is the same guy, so they take the notes and diligently compare it to what they had been written in crayon on the barn back in 1990. Quoted from Detective Clint Hetrick of Indiana State Police and sourced from the ID show I mentioned before, quote, The handwriting appeared to be the same, and the context of the message appeared to be the same. 
end quote. They analyzed the writing after calling in the FBI and had a profile for the killer. Mid-40s, white male, and because of the location and how well he seemed to know the area, he indeed lived in Fort Wayne. Still, no suspect, but the technology behind DNA sciences had advanced by 2004. All of the fluid samples from the underwear were compared to the used condoms, and they matched. This further proved that the killer was still out there and close by. Just as they're closing in and have their break, they compared the samples with what came from Sarah Bowker, and that one was not even remotely a match. The person that killed April was not the same person that killed Sarah Bowker. They then compared all the DNA samples in their database, hoping that this case would be closed and they'd have their suspect. Nothing turned up, so the killer is completely off the radar as far as his DNA, or hiding in plain sight. It started to get where the case was kind of put on the back burner again. Everyone at this point is feeling hopeless. April's cousin, Christina Snyder, is quoted as remembering her uncle feeling hopeless and saying that he's going to die and he would never know who killed April. The family refused to accept that. So the family and the neighbors did build a garden in remembrance of April where she had been abducted and it's just beautiful. There's a sign in front that says April's garden and it's got her picture on it. There's a little, it looks kind of like an outhouse, like a birdhouse, but it's an outhouse. And it's behind it. There's several angel statues. It's surrounded by all kinds of flowers. It's one of those things where you'd want to just sit in there and just be at peace, meditate and pray. But it's also very heartbreaking and bittersweet to see. It's just, it's stunning. When I saw this, and I'm really not trying to be dramatic here, but I just, I kind of broke down. It was so beautiful, but also can you even begin to imagine what that family was going through, especially Janet. People would often stop by this garden and leave memories, well wishes, even items. But the family thought this was nice, but still the big elephant was in the room, which was, who did this? They also very understandably would inwardly question each person who stopped by, wondering if they were any way involved. I mean, yeah, they meant well and their hearts were in the right place, but... That's a very understandable suspicion. I would personally be suspicious of everyone. At this point, the family's finally beginning to lose hope and they're concluding that their killer will most likely never be found and the case comes to a standstill once again. But in 2015, there was a very sophisticated computer program used by a laboratory in Virginia creating a new sketch of what the killer might have looked like. This was vital, along with the DNA, to try to get a little closer. The following year, they created a new sketch of what he might have looked like in the present. The detectives refused to give up. In 2016, detectives Brian Martin and Clint Hedrick joined the cold case unit to try to solve this case. I want to note here that when what had happened to April had occurred in 1988, these two detectives were still children. They grew up to be detectives and wanted to solve that case. That's kind of an indication of how deep this community was with this little angel. In 2018, with the 30-year anniversary of April's murder fast approaching, they came across an article where a homicide case in Arizona was solved using familial DNA. And the same year, a new law went into effect that was designed to solve crimes such as the April Tinsley case, as well as that of the Golden State Killer. As of January 1st, those arrested for a felony in the state of Indiana had to submit DNA samples from a cheek swab. Then, DNA samples are collected for Indiana's CODIS, which stands for Combined DNA Inclusion System. This occurred after Indiana passed the Senate Enrolled Act 322. The samples are compared to other profiles in the database, hoping to increase chances of solving older crimes or cold cases. Yes, Ancestry.com systems submit DNA to CODIS. So, if you are a serial killer or rapist hoping to find a long-lost relative, well, you're fucked now, so... The team enters the killer's DNA they had into a very advanced DNA testing lab for analysis. They were looking for any clue that they could, even if it was relative, something. They could ask questions and interview family members, and it would 
make it so much easier for, to solve this case. So they did get a match. It was two brothers. There was Peter Miller and John Miller. So they searched their local database for both names. Peter Miller lived in California. His younger brother, John, who was 59, lived in a trailer home around nine miles away from April's home his entire life. Hetrick and Martin started surveillance on John Miller's home. He was seen coming out of the home and he looks just like an older version of the original composite sketch. He even fit the exact profile. And then we've got John D. Miller, who was born July 7th of 1959. Where he was born is is unknown, but he was a former Walmart employee. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but people surrounding him described him as difficult, reclusive, with a bad temper, but otherwise just another normal person. Neighbors also described him as maybe a little off, but they never would have suspected him of doing this. He was possibly intellectually disabled, and this isn't to excuse him by any means. I said it in the original episode, and I'll say it again. A piece of shit, well, a piece of shit is a piece of shit, regardless of mental, emotional, even physical capability. The detectives went further and followed him when he left his home after two hours of surveillance. They followed him to a well-known big box realtor, Walmart, and followed him inside. He was then seen in uniform stocking toys on a shelf in the children's department. He had been employed there for 10 years. He had been hanging around the toy section and who knows how many kids had been there or through there. They didn't have any solid evidence just yet to arrest this person. They waited until about 3 a.m. and pulled several bags of trash out of his trash can. They found several used condoms, sent them to the state police laboratory in Indianapolis, and it was an exact match. Then, on July 15, 2018, they apprehended John Miller at his job, and he willingly went. They formally interviewed him. The entire time he's chilling and acting relaxed, they asked him why he thought they picked him up, and he said, quote, I think probably the Tinsley case. That's the only one I can think of, end quote. They asked him why he would say something weird like that, and he started to kind of show resistance, so they pressed on. They revealed that the DNA evidence singled him out as the main suspect after 30 years. They asked John if he was sorry for this, and in a flippant kind of way, he said, mm, yeah. Yeah, he was pretty much like, yeah, I guess, just sh shut up. You know, no remorse. Absolutely no fucking remorse. And then he admitted that he abducted, raped, and killed April. He confessed and explained how he did it. He saw her, he saw the opportunity, he parked at the corner, saw her coming up, and he just kind of waited for her and then grabbed her. He had told her not to scream and to do as he said and that he wouldn't hurt her. And then they drove to his house and she kept saying, don't hurt me, I'll do whatever you say. And this next part makes me sick to my stomach because he says, quote, that afternoon I had sex with her. He then goes on to say in such a flippant and careless attitude, I just had the urge, you know? And then he goes on and drinks his water if he's, as if he's sitting in a bar with some fucking friends. They ask her why he didn't just let her go and he goes, I thought about it, but I was afraid that she would tell. At that, and that's when I started choking her and I had sex with her one time after she was dead. Sidebar, just so you all know, rape is not sex. It is rape. End of story. We have seen the media and also interrogation videos ask offenders or talk about offenders, often saying things like, they then forcibly had sex with the victim. No, rape is rape. Okay, back to the story. He admits that he made two attempts to do the same thing when he was just 15. They were unsuccessful. He insisted that April is his only victim. For the most part, the family finally got closure, and the trial was originally set to be in February of 2019, but it never happened. The months following his arrest, his attorneys argued that he wouldn't get a fair trial with a jury chosen from Allen County due to public outrage. They said that the offenses were alleged, and that the opinions of his guilt and character were speculated. His attorneys were given until November of that same year to explain why a change of venue was appropriate, but instead of discussing the case, John Miller was brought before Allen County Judge John F. Serbeck and pled guilty. Serbeck charged John Miller with felony murder, 
child molestation and criminal confinement. Miller pled guilty and was sentenced to 80 years in prison with zero chance of an appeal, narrowly missing the death penalty. Unfortunately, Miller will be released six days after his 99th birthday in 2058, 70 years after he did what he did. For April's mother, Janet, it was as though this had all happened yesterday. She spoke in court, saying even though it's been 30 years, she still remembers the day like it was yesterday, telling Miller he ripped her family apart. She also looked at Miller and said, you took her life, we want yours saying that 80 years he's getting is far less than what he has made the family deal with. April's mom also told Miller that he threw April's body out like it was trash and that she will never forgive him or forgive what he took from her until the day she dies. Christina Snyder, the cousin, mentioned her. We mentioned her briefly before. She said she uses the word human loosely when describing Miller. She also called Miller an animal and looked at him and said he was a cold-hearted monster. Detective Dan Camp, one of the detectives who was working this case and who is now retired, told ABC 21 in Indiana that there was enormous pressure to solve this case, so he never gave up. He was obsessed with finding this guy. He felt that he kept missing something, little details here and there that could crack the case, but nothing kept showing up. He finally retired because this search was unfortunately unsuccessful. He kept April's picture in his wallet the entire time and worked tirelessly to solve the case. Camp also stated that he was very thankful that Janet did not have to endure a trial because with a crime of this caliber and what may have transpired in that trailer, that would be absolutely grueling and the details would come to light in a trial. Janet is quoting saying that she misses April and missed out on seeing April growing up, having kids of her own, having girl time, having a normal life. It was ripped from her. The rape and murder of Sarah Jean Boker does remain unsolved to this very day. And John's younger brother comes forward, according to one of the sources we list. John's younger brother, who asked to remain nameless, said that he had seen John that very morning that he was arrested. He said that he's always helped his brother John with meals and handyman type work. The way I read it was as though he was like, after all of that... He'd expressed pure disbelief when he found out that they were there to arrest him in relation to the April Tinsley case. And I mean, I can understand that. Like, you know, imagine being in the shoes of this person, finding out that your family member did something horrific. But, you know, with that, he also said that his brother was born, quote, this is in quotes, a little slow and never had a girlfriend. And I mean, that's one thing I want to mention real quick. One thing I learned in that job I used to work for that I mentioned earlier, it's not always the case, but it's typical of a pedophile to be unmarried and unattached. I stress that being unmarried or unattached does not equate to being a pedophile, and it does not cause this, but it is a weird fact that an offender is never married or attached. This younger brother shed some light on John saying that it's possible he was molested when he was staying at the Wood Youth Center Reform School. He said John had always had a bad temper, but never suspected him to do anything like this. He stated, shocked, but also that his brother had done what he had done and basically said that John was now dead to him. He said if they needed him as a witness for anything, that they'd have to force him because he had no intention of seeing his brother or anything. You know, mm. Y'all, I I try to keep my comments to myself, but, uh, you know, I've been working on my filter, but uh, (laughs) I can't. I can't. To me, the way John's brother came off was narcissistic and also completely unfair. I mean, he was more worried about how he would look than about helping that family to get justice. And I'm sorry, but that's a sympathizer if I've ever seen one. He was helpful in the way that, you know, he said he remembered seeing the handwriting on the news, but was a bit surprised he didn't put two and two together. That's definitely his handwriting he was quoted as as saying, but he also said that he was thankful his parents were not alive to see this because, like everyone else, they were aware of the April Tinsley case. He said the whole thing makes him sick and, quote, whatever he gets, he deserves. I just wish he would have got caught a long time ago. He's going to have to pay for what he did, even if that's the death penalty. That little girl died, didn't she? I mean... You know, I just, I don't know. 
uh, there's always somebody that makes this whole thing about themselves, and that just pisses me off to the umpth degree. Like, it's not- you are not the fucking victim, dude. It's not you, okay? It's about the family, April Tinsley's family, not you. Who care- uh, right now, who cares about your feelings? Just, you know, give some information and, you know, I don't know, grieve for your brother. I understand that, but do that- do that quietly because- there's bigger fucking fish to fry here, you know? I haven't done this in a while, but I want to end this with a quote. This one is from Christina Snyder, the cousin. She ended her statement in court by looking at Miller directly in his saggy ass bitch eyes, telling him to quote, burn in hell, you monster, end quote. I concur. Burn in hell, you fucking monster. Anyway, don't forget that in a few short weeks, we have the True Crime Podcast Festival, and we would love to see you. If you see us, be sure to stop by and say hi. Yes, come get stickers and buttons. Also, speaking of stickers and buttons, go check out our Patreon. It's been revamped. All right, that's it. This case really took it out of me. Fucking fuck. Man, we're going to get so many people telling me, you know, y'all could do without the F-bombs. No, (laughs) this case kills me. This case kills me. I mentioned it in the first episode and a little bit in the beginning here, but you know, that little girl just looks scarily similar to my own and I just cannot even fathom why anyone would do such a thing. Murderers are evil, but ones that hurt innocent children are a special kind of fucked up. April and her family are bees. We must always protect the bees because when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Original intro music by Ghost Stories Incorporated. Remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional music provided by Epidemic Sound. This podcast was researched, scripted, and produced by Amanda Cronin and Courtney Finner. A Nefarious Nightmare is a Cloud 10 I Heart podcast. Managed by... A Nefarious Nightmare, Sim Sarna, and Jamie Rice of Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. Thank you again for listening, and be vigilant.